Hello, and welcome to the Greenlands. I am so happy to finally bring you season four, The Battle of the Ley Lines, after a really long hiatus. This is the last season of The Chronicles, but there will be more Greenlands, just not quite The Chronicles. It brings together the characters from the previous three seasons and ties up a bunch of plot points, but at least I hope it does. If you see any plot holes, do tell me. There's also dragons, some demons, some magic, some old gods, and if we're lucky, a marriage, because, you know, end on marriage, man. If you want more info about what's going on with the Greenlands project, sign up for our newsletter on our website at the-greenlands.com or just link in whatever buyer of social media you happen to find. If you like what we're doing here and want to give us some advice or just want to tell us you love us, drop us a rating, review, or comment because it makes me happy and it helps, okay? I think I'm getting the hang of this. For this episode of Battle of the Ley Lines, I would like to thank our incredible cast, James Hare, David McCran, Helen Very, Kitty Bennett, Linda Dutson, Sam Perry, Vicky Holding, and Alex Gardner. On with the episode, kids. The dining hall inside the Baron's castle, it is daytime. The Baron, a middle-aged, large, burly man, goblin, with small undertusks, is seated at a table with his two sons, Burb, who is twelve, and Adamant, who is a blonde, handsome and dashing man of twenty-two. Further down from them is an empty chair, and then the Baron's eighteen-year-old daughter, Uissa. There is also two young men, Morag and Quinn, either side of the table, further down. Uissa keeps sneaking glances at Morag and smiling. Morag keeps doing the same to her. His messmate, Quinn, is a good-humoured, open-faced twenty-year-old with a burnt but healed hand and short brown hair. They are all trying to eat their breakfast and quietly to converse, but are distracted by the entrance of the Baroness, who is micromanaging the taking down of one of the big chandeliers. The Baroness gestures nervously. Lower it slowly, Spillikins. Slowly. <laughs> oh, don't you worry, Mom. We'll have it down in a... <laughs> Someone accidentally lets slip the rope, and there is a... <coughs> Spillikins rushes over to see if there is any damage. Oh, <coughs> oh it's fine, Mum. Fine. <coughs> Good iron, this. <coughs> I was worried about the tiling, Spillikins. The chandeliers have had worse. The Baron looks up from his plate. Wife, do we have to have wedding preparations during breakfast? She is also managing the taking down of the tapestries for cleaning and the scrubbing of the far side of the floor. The Baroness makes vigorous scrubbing actions at the old woman who is on her knees, listlessly making swirls with her brush. Elbow grease, Gertin! Elbow grease! The old woman, none too bright, looks up, hang doggedly, and then speeds up her brushing. The Baroness looks up at the two girls who have just brought the first tapestry down. Just a quick dusting, Hadrida, before you roll it up. One of them hits the rug with a carpet beater. There is a great cloud of dust which erupts and settles on Burb, who coughs all over his breakfast. Adamant smiles and lifts his eyebrows at Morag. You're going to wish you'd eloped before Mater is finished. Quinn leans across to Morag. I'm sure I could find that bunk. I'm sure being a demon doesn't take away his ability to officiate. That's enough, Adamant. If you've finished your breakfast, you and your friends can give the girls a hand with the tapestries and carry them down to the sewing room. Good. Oh, I might get some peace then. I don't think I can survive another three weeks of this. Outside the front door of the convent, it's daytime. Three middle to late-aged priestesses of the sun are standing bidding farewell to two priestesses on the backs of donkeys. These travellers are the abbess, Mother Euphemia, and Sister Patience, 21, beautiful, voluptuous, and totally naive. The travelling priestesses are seated astride. Sister Bloodwood, the refectioner standing nearby, is buxom, plain, and cheerful. Right, well, bring us some holy relics back for my knees. Another thin, vinegary priestess chides her. The shrine of the bed is a place for healing and wisdom, Sister Blodwyn. Not a shop of souvenirs for you. I remember when they used to sell little pendant necklaces with them bone on. I still have one somewhere. She rummages around in her robe pockets, muttering to herself. Thank you so much for the amulet, Sister Lettuce. I hope it protects you and gives you good fortune on your journey, child. Remember not to fall for the trickery of men. 
Yes, the last thing we want is for patients to get boned on the way to the bone shrine. Sister Letice kicks her ankle, causing Bloodwin to hop around, swearing. Patience looks a little confused. The abbess turns the reins of her donkey. She smiles a beautific smile on the three remaining priestesses. May the sun shine on your days, my daughters. She makes the sign of the sun. The other three priestesses return the salute and all say at the same time, And, and on yours, yours mother. mother. The abbess and sister patients ride away. Bloodwin pulls out a necklace with a small bone on it. She holds it up to Letice. My last husband, may he rest in peace, thought it was humorous. She grins widely at Letice, who groans, sighs and turns away. Bloodwin follows her, waving the necklace and cackling. A corridor inside the Baron's castle. It is daytime. Quinn is walking back from helping with the tapestries and brushing himself down when he notices that a couple of his points are undone. He stops and starts to tie them up. Around the corner, further along the corridor, there is a smallish, plump, tonsured monk in a brown gown with a slight green cast to his face. He is examining a lock on a door. Burb comes along the corridor, whistling. The monk, seeing and hearing him, furtively flicks his hood up. Burb pauses and addresses him. Oh, hello, father. Brother, my son, only brother. I am only Brother Boswell, a humble mendicant who has been given a meal by your kind household. Oh, so you're fixing the lock then? Um, sort of. I have heard tale of a lock in the Brethnak Castle, which can grant the finder a wish. Burb seems to consider this. He is a bit slow. Quinn has heard this and is now very carefully listening to the conversation. Oh, can I have the wishes if I find it? Maybe. How do I find it then? You can spot it by looking deep inside the lock. If it glows with a green hue, that's the one you want. Huh? I would have spotted a glowing lock before. Ah, not this one. This one you must put a rowan twig next to, and then look deep into the lock. Not only do you need to do this, but you also need to know how to use the lock to get the wishes. If it was easy, everyone would be getting wishes. Burb seems to agree with this. It makes sense after all. How do you make it work then? Ah, that will take far too long to explain. When you find it, come fetch me. I shall unlock it, and we can then both have a wish. Remember, though, you must keep it a secret. A wish is a dangerous thing. You wouldn't want any old person getting one, no? The monk grins, and his eyes flare weirdly. He walks away, pulling his hood over his head. Quinn stands musing on what he has just heard. Burb stares closely at the lock. Quinn finishes tying his waist laces and stands up. He pulls loose the laces and his codpiece swings free. A maid who hurries past. She takes one look at him. Then she looks down. She looks horrified, screams and runs away. Quinn is confused. He looks down and almost screams too. Quinn fumbles frantically with his codpiece ties. A country lane during the day. The abbess and sister patients are travelling along on their donkeys. Their bags are strapped onto the animals behind them. The sun is beautiful and there is nature occurring all around them. The abbess is reading a book and letting her animal be guided by patients. I am looking forward to seeing this library. Abba Hakitov seemed happy to have us visit to research your case. I wonder how sisters Mavis and Bluster fare. The last time we saw them, they were not doing so well. Well, he is a master of medicine and has the command of surgery that even our sister Agatha does not have. So they are in the best hands I could think of. That's why I sent them there. I pray for them that the sun warms their souls and lights their paths. Hmm. 
wouldn't that be a little complicated if they are devotees of the moon? She smiles teasingly at Patience, who seems to have taken this question seriously. Ah, you are saying that they would wish to get their guidance from the moon. But I cannot pray to the moon, mother, as I am a son. I was only joking, child. Oh. They ride on. The abbess sighs and turns her page. The book is entitled 499 Ways to Use a Saw in a Surgery by I. Hackitoff, Cenobite. Outside the main entrance to the Shrine of the Bone, it is daytime. Abba Hagitov, a comfortable middle-aged priest with greased-down hair and a green gown, is standing, looking and waiting. Along with him, two priestesses, one middle-aged and hulking and rather ugly, and with a tendency to peer, and one priestess who is young but plain. The abbess and sister patients ride up on their donkeys. Sisters, sisters, welcome to the Shrine of the Bone. Delighted to see you, to see you. The abbess smiles at and gives her reins to the young sister Mavis, who smiles and offers to take them. The older priestess, Sister Bluster, takes the reins of Sister Patience's donkey. The abbess bows slightly and makes the sign of the sun. Abba does his own complicated hand sign in return. Sister Patience and the abbess dismount. You see, Mother, your protégés from the old prairie of the moon have now come true to perfect health, and all for only a florin each. He winks a few times at the abbess, who finally takes the hint and gets some coins out of her pouch. Oh, uh, oh, of course. Thank you, Abba. Thank you for your work with them. Abba pockets the coins and sets off down the path, followed by the priestesses. Oh, thank you, Mother. Thank you. Now, come in, come in, and I will show you to your rooms. The abbess turns to look at the other two priestesses. I am pleased to see you, my children. Do you feel better after your shocks? Sister Bluster screws up her eyes. Aye, oh, yeah, that we do. Well, the world does seem a little darker these days. Uh, um, and you, Sister Mavis? I am greatly better, Mother. Thank you. Then you must come visit us at the Sanctuary of the Peaceful Tears, my daughters. Thank you, Mother. Thank you, Mother. The abbess turns back to the Cenobite as they are approaching the shrine building. I see you have increased your following quite extensively, Abba. You are now selling bone-shaped biscuits, I hear. Abba suddenly looks shifty. Oh, on reflection, Mother Euphemia, I will leave you in the more capable hands of these sisters, as I have to go and sell, uh, I mean provide some pardonings to our new pilgrims, just arrived. Some of them may even want to buy my new line in forgiveness scrolls. I will see you at dinner, Mother. Business uh, duty calls. The Cenobite smiles and hurries off past loads of small baskets with trinkets in which there are signs pricing them. The business room in the Baron's castle. It is daytime. The Baron is sitting with his feet up on another chair, drinking wine from a goblet. He looks up. Ah, morning, Adamant. Come in, lad. Come in. Good morning, father. Ah, sit thee down, sit thee down, and tell me what's been a-doing this last week. I need to know how my young sprig is managing his new garrison. I'm doing my best, sir, but I fear that the men have no former experience of discipline and fail to understand the need for marching and weapons training. The Baron bangs down his goblet, and some of the wine slops out. At his teeth! The men here have had peace for too long. They've got soft. Your friends got any ideas? Well... As you know, Morag only stays until his marriage to Eurissa. We have the terrible problem that whenever he tries to teach them any kind of martial skill, the men either immediately surrender or suddenly acquire an illness. Weaklings! Fools! Also, Quinn can't help, as he has no authority, because he is to train as a sorcerer and he's not a knight. Anyway, that ad... He keeps setting fire to himself, which is not very good for morale. Uh, I suppose not. I think a good course of flogging is in order until morale improves. Um, I believe that chapter four of Lord Bosquit's Manual for Martial Management says that flogging isn't a good idea for improving morale. Ugh. 
Well, tell the men to prepare for inspection by their rightful lord. Tell them that any that fail in their march formations and correct use of their weapons during my inspections will cut all the wife's lawns with a penknife wearing women's clothes. Women's clothes, sir? The Baron snatches a crossbow off the table and sights down it. Aye. There is one thing worse for a man than gardening for another man's wife, and that is gardening as another man's wife. Adam looks a bit confused by this, but doesn't argue. The courtyard of the Baron's castle. It is daytime. Adamant and Morag, in partial armour and chainmail, are walking back towards the stables area. They are removing their helmets. About twenty rough, seedy-looking males carrying long staves are still filing out of the yard at the other side. Do you really think they're getting better, Morag? Huh. If we were actually at war, they would all be dead in under two minutes. <sighs> I know. It's just very hard to get them motivated. There's no threats for them to work against. Quinn said they all felt a bit stupid waving sticks around. They arrive at the other side of the courtyard. Burb walks out of the stables with Morag's horses. Uh, Burb, use my old saddle. You can't scratch it up any worse than it is. Burb nods. Anyway, you can hardly expect loyalty and hard work when they used to be your enemies. The only reason they are here is because they were forced into employment with you to avoid prison. Oh, Burb, bring my horse out and saddle it up as well, will you? Burb puts his hands to his hips. I'm not your squire. Do your own. Morag rolls his eyes, vanishes into the stable and emerges with his horse's bridle, which he puts onto his horse. It's not just that, though. I thought the knighting was going to be heroic. Rescuing damsels and... Fighting dragons! Not exercising bad-tempered ex-brigands over and over again. Bab! Horse! No! Adamant is standing over Burb. Won't give you my old chain mail. And Mum will make you wear Uis's leather armour. You've got to. Uis's pretty armour has nice flowers worked into it. Oh, all right. But I'm Morag Squire, not yours. He gives a tug to the last buckle on the girth strap and then returns into the stable. Adamant gives a superior shake of his head to Morag as Morag looks at him. Ugh, squires. I don't have a problem with them. Must be your command style. Adamant opens his mouth to argue. Quinn emerges from the side door. He looks at the other two. Well, it's noon. Said I'd be ready. Where's my horse? Burb? No and no. You're not even a knight. Quinn raises his eyebrows at the other two. Adamant shrugs and Morag grins wolfishly. Inside the solar of the Baron's castle, it's daytime. Louisa is cuddling and mooing at her small, ugly black dog while sitting on the settle by the fire. And Imelda, the Baroness's companion, is sewing nearby. The Baroness is sitting at a work table, surrounded by parchments and trying to make a list. The cook comes into the room and curtsies. Maria said, as how you wanted to see me, my lady. Yes, cook. I just thought we'd run over a menu for the wedding. We do want to show the other aristocracy that we can put on a good spread. Now sit down, please. The cook looks suspiciously at all of the papers. I'd rather not. If you don't mind, my lady, not with all them parchmenty things. Oh, but I thought you might like to make a note of my various ideas. The cook looks further askance. I don't think I want to get dirtied with all that inking stuff, if you don't mind, my lady. Well, will you be able to remember all of the courses? The cook sniffs and bridles. I was the one who was head cook to the funeral of your father-in-law, with four heads of state and all. I remembered all fourteen courses, and none of that inky stuff, neither. Oh, well. I thought for the first course we could have peacock soup. and... Uh, but I thought... We always have soup. Oh, well. Hmm. Then for the second course, I, I thought we could have... Dumplings. 
a la reine. Oh, but don't you think the dumplings are a little... No. Followed by capon ball and then lots of puddings. Oh, but if we could just have... Uh... Little curtsies. So I'll just get on with sorting the kitchen things then, ma'am. Well, if you... The cook turns and marches out. Lisa turns to her mother, tongue-in-cheek. What was that about Peacock and the aristocracy, mother dear? The Baroness narrows her eyes, then turns her head and glares at her daughter. Woods within the Baron's demean. It's daytime. Jem, a young horse thief from a nearby village, is sitting under a tree with his hands in his pockets and looking surly and depressed. He has his belongings in a bundle on a stick on his shoulder. A demon monk steps out from behind the tree and joins him. Jem gets up and starts walking. The monk makes a show of shaking off the rain. Jem starts walking and the monk joins him. Good morrow, my son. <laughs> my, your temperament is suiting the weather. Why so glum, my child? It's my own affair. I don't need no salvation. If you want to lecture me, or morality, go and find another tree to sit under. Morality? I never mentioned morality. My god is less concerned with morality than the other gods. He simply likes his will to be done. How it is done is of no concern. I do not judge others' suffering. Oh, how kind. I feel so welcomed. Like I give a damn about your judging me. I've got enough of that already. Indeed. Who has been passing an unjust judgment on such a fine young man? Well, my family is poor, right? And I want you to get married, right? And the girl I want you to marry, well, she wants a good wedding, right? And she deserves a good life. Oh, indeed. That is understandable. My job wasn't giving me enough money. I didn't want to wait until 30 before I can ruddy well marry. The monk nods and produces a flask and takes a sip. So, you found other ways of making money, as any sane man would. Aye, and it was all going well. I almost said enough to ask her to marry me. The demon monk passes the flask to Jem. Oh, <coughs> hound's teeth! This stuff is strong. <coughs> what kind of monk are you? One who knows the reality of life, my friend. Now, I am assuming that someone or something put a stop to your good fortune. They did. The swine. In one go, right, they killed my friends, took my money, my girl, my job and had labelled me a horse thief. I lost everything. He takes a long swing from the flask. The monk nods sadly. It is not my place to suggest this, I suppose, but I know of a god who will help you with your plight. Oh, really? Who? Ah, this is an old god who writes wrongs. What does he want in exchange? <laughs> oh, you're a smart man. The price to pay is but a little blood. How much is a little? Sacrifice a lamb on the altar of the old elven grove in Shreem. Pour its blood on the altar and utter your invocation. Kill an animal in there? Now why? I know the elves hate any death in their places. We all know what happens if you so much as injure an animal near any of their sacred glades. Ah, do not worry. That legend of a curse is not true. It may have held some power in the ancient days, but not anymore. <laughs> Ruddy vegans.
is episode one of the Battle of the Leylines from the Greeners Presents. I would like to thank the incredible Ellen Glenn for editing this episode and the talented Dennis Moyne for providing with music. If you want to support us, share us with a friend or victim who you think will like us. If not, I will curse you to an eternity of slightly overcooked broccoli. And as we all know, that's like the worst thing you can have. Anyway, love y'all. Thank you for your support. Don't forget to drop a comment or a like. See y'all next time.